Hey, welcome to the show today. Um, I have the distinct honor and privilege of having uh, one of my clients with me today, uh, Dr. Portia Rawls. Rawls. <laughs> um, she's got an amazing background and story that we're going to talk about today. Um, she's written a couple of books that we're going to talk about. Um, and with her diverse background, this is going to be a lot of fun because Portia was a fireman. Firefighter. <laughs> ah, I was waiting to be corrected on that. Um, and, you know, we're going to talk about language and uh, the, the terms that we use today and, you know, how as society changes mm-hmm. and as culture changes, we need to uh, be enlightened and informed. And um, we're looking forward to an opportunity today to, to be taught some great things about uh, the industry that you're in now, the industry that you came from, how those kind of correlate. And that's um, one of the things we like to say on Black Box is we like to talk about everything from oxygen to money okay. All right. and everything in between. And then I make the joke that, have you ever tried to live a day without oxygen or without money? <laughs> they kind of feel the same, I would I would guess, you know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. R- really hard. And, you know, if you're in a... a, a burning building we were talking off camera that most people usually die Mm -hmm. from asphyxiation Mm -hmm. from from the smoke so that that's i I shouldn't make a joke that's terrible no jokes there um but before we get started i was telling you off camera one of the things we like to do is is honor our men and women in uniform uh from our nation's military to our, our servants uh in the city federal level and you know i have to apologize to all you guys who are uh in the fire service business in the uh men and women in blue and in Mm -hmm. uniform who's who's better the fire folks or or the police folks you're gonna star something (laughs) (laughs) obviously i'm gonna say firefighters so i had my my uh my buddy brent who's now a realtor um Mm -hmm. who's a retired virginia beach police officer and i I had him on the show, and we were talking about donuts, and <laughs> we were talking about bacon. Okay. And so, what? What's uh, you guys go to the grocery store? A yeah, lot. we you know yeah. the fire the fire service and fire departments are known for their firehouse cooks. Firehouse so, cooks. cooks. That's what we call them. So the cook probably has more power than the officers in the station. <laughs> okay, were you? No, I was not You're the not, cook, no? but I had my last few years when I was a captain at um, Station 9 in Norfolk, I had one, I had an amazing cook, and everybody understood, don't mess with the cook, <laughs> you know, so um, he loved to watch cooking shows. He was almost, he was almost a chef, to be honest with you. That's that how would be a fun reality show. Has anybody done, like, the fire cooks, fire, you know, I firehouse think cooks? That would be a more, I don't know, but... It, I mean, some of the All right, Ian, you got to talk to some of your folks in the movie business, and (laughs) that's a reality show. Oh, yeah. That's amazing what's high well. Even when I came in my rookie year, the gentleman, he actually taught me how to cook some, some... I knew how to cook, but I learned a lot from my the cook that was in the station my rookie year, because that's how amazing of a cook he was. So let's do this. Okay. Let's toast the firehouse cooks and the future of uh, reality shows for for that, (laughs) but also our, our men and women... In uh, fire service, yeah. our police department, our military, mm-hmm. love those guys, mm-hmm. especially love Marines. Um, but you know, now I'm playing favorites, and you'll, you'll have to work with me okay. as you, in your psychological field for my uh, favoritism there. But uh, Blue right. Label, we, we like a little bit of Johnny Walker Blue Label, which is kind of like that corn okay. wine you had down in North Carolina <laughs> this weekend. So okay. cheers to cheers. you and your comrades. All righty. Down the hatches. Not bad, right? Actually, tastes pretty good. Yeah, a little oaky. <laughs> we got an oak tree. We just sucked oh, down. Okay. It's yeah, very good stuff. It's one of my favorites. Okay. Um, kind of like the folks that serve in our nation's best, from the fire service yeah. to the police department. And you have a lot of ex-military so. in the public safety. Yeah. 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 That, that that's a great point. That um, most people who are retiring from their first career, mm-hmm. or even if they spent four years or eight years. Mm-hmm. 
they end up continuing to serve. Um, because I think it comes back to that camaraderie, doesn't it? That esprit de corps that you have with Yeah, and you know, um, public safety, fire service, um, police are paramilitary. So yeah. what I found over the years, a lot of the military that end up coming into the service, they like the structure. They yeah. like the command structure, the chain of command. You kind of yeah. know what you're going to do every day. You know what you're going to wear every day. Yeah. Um, I joke with my friends, my first year out of the fire service, it took me quite a while because I had to actually pick out my clothes every day to go into the office as a psychologist. I just couldn't open you know, a closet and pick out this uniform for the day. And people think that, you know, I joke and I say, you know, that was kind of stressful for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's I had to funny. worry about my work uniform for 13 years, and now all of a sudden yeah. it's like, I gotta, oh, I got to figure out. Figure, that's, to you know, uh, Zuck, Zuckerberg, he always wears a gray T-shirt and a pair of jeans simply because he doesn't want to have to think or worry himself with. Uh, and I understood, I read that. And I said, Isn't hmm. that interesting? Yeah. yeah. And I could understand why, yeah. You, mm-hmm. you have all that money, and then you're like, no, nah, gray shirt and jeans, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, People don't realize that little thing, how much of a difference. But I found the military is an easy transition for military personnel. So we we got a, an hour today, and we got to cram a lot of stuff in mm-hmm. because you're a really, really interesting person to have on the show in the sense that you you were part of a fire department. You're a black female. Mm-hmm. Um, but now you're a psychologist. You have a doctorate. Yes. In psychology, and you have a very successful business you run. We'll, if we can, we'll talk mm-hmm. about that a little okay. bit. That in helping and serving people and and getting their mental health yeah. uh, back as as great as they can. And yeah, and I, I still see it. You know, people say, "How in the world did you go from being a firefighter to being a clinical psychologist?" But I still see it as they're both helping professions. Yeah, I'm just in a different arena now, and um, I still work with the fire service. Um, when I first became a psychologist, I did a lot of um, presentation and training at conferences in the fire service around the nation, trying to educate and trying to get them to uh, really embrace the need to care for their mental health. Um, and that has been bittersweet. They've mm. gotten better, but they're not as advanced as the police departments across the nation, um, but I continue still to do direct care work with firefighters yeah. and just consult with them and consult with fire departments about mental health issues that may arise among their members. Well, they're seeing some pretty tragic stuff, those firefighters day in, day oh, yeah. out. Oh, yeah. Uh, so people, on that level, is that what you help help with? Yeah, most people don't, yeah, because, you know, a lot of PTSD, a lot of depression, a lot of alcoholism, um, drug use that's emerging. Hmm. Um not just in the fire service, I don't want to just single them out, but even among public safety in general, because yeah. like we were talking off off of camera or off before we came on the air, is that most firefighting or fire departments respond to every 9-11 emergency. They respond to yeah. EMS, they respond to hazmat, they respond to natural disasters, <laughs> they respond to domestic violence, they respond to the car accidents, they, they yeah. respond to the drownings, they re- I mean, you name it. And there's either an ambulance or a fire engine that's when there's a 9-11 call that we're, they respond to the hostage situations in case somebody wow, gets yeah. shot, that we got to go in and try to help them. Um, so there's nothing. So they see yeah. so much, you know. And th- that... I knew that, Mm -hmm. but I didn't know that Mm -hmm. until uh, I was reading through your your book last night, Mm -hmm. and I was like, holy cow, you're right. You guys respond to every emergency call. Mm -hmm. And I notice a lot of times that, you know, here in Virginia Beach, every day I see a fire truck, I Mm -hmm. see an EMS vehicle, an ambulance, and then in Virginia Beach, shout out to our folks in uh, the emergency medical service, because Virginia Beach specifically it's a volunteer it's squad a, it's still a volunteer norfolk st- it's a uh, paid, paid service yeah paid um you have i think hampton is still uh, like combination apartment meaning they're paid and volunteer wow um and newport news is paid chesapeake i still think they have some fo- they have, have some volunteers okay. i'm not sure about yeah. that but yeah but it's it's yeah we see a lot of stuff but they're on every call every call wow Wow. And s- if you're in a busy city, you're going from one call to the next, and you really don't have time to decompress. Mm. So 
I can give you an example. I remember my first year, first or second year I was on I was in the department and I was actually on duty Christmas Day. Yeah. So our first call at nine o'clock in the morning was we went to this elderly couple. Um, her husband had collapsed. He was dead. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this is Christmas Day. So we worked him, which means we provided care, even though we knew he was not, we were re- weren't likely going to bring him back. Because sometimes for family members, it helps them psychologically to better accept the death. Um, but I'm like, okay, it's Christmas morning. This is supposed to be a happy holiday time. Yeah. And I'm having to tell this woman that we have to pronounce your husband dead. Okay. Mm-hmm. And you leave there, and then we went to another call. I think we had a fire that day. I mean, it was just surreal because all the rest of America was, oh, it's Christmas and the Christmas tree, and we're opening presents, and yeah. yet it's all of this tragedy Jeez. that's happening. So from a firefighter, think about that. Just to, you know, as yeah. a psychologist, I can talk about it now. It's like a cognitive dissonance because your brain says this is supposed to be mm. a happy, fun time, yeah. but my reality is that I'm responding to all of these tragedies. So you're probably dealing with a, a certain amount of guilt that comes up where mm-hmm. I get to go home, I get to see my family, mm-hmm. I get to celebrate mm-hmm. uh, Christmas or what, whatever holiday you celebrate on the yeah. 25th of December. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, that's true. Everybody doesn't celebrate Christmas. Forgive me uh, for not being culturally competent there. <laughs> I, I, I just figured I would get my little plug in. Where, yes. But no, I celebrate Christmas, and mm-hmm. if you're mad at me, be mad at me. It's okay. Yeah, So, but no. just, just to... Just a lot of what you see. And then yeah. most people think, well, EMS, you know, you're just going in there and you're, you're helping people that are sick or ill. But some of the situations we would go into would be pretty volatile. And you didn't know what was coming at you. Mm-hmm. There were certain neighborhoods we went into. You may, you may have somebody coming at you with a knife. And you're just trying to provide yeah, care. I need to drink a little more. I remember we went through a period in Norfolk where the gangs were fighting each other. And so what would happen is they would have these gunshot victims and we would pull up on the scene and then they would start trying to shoot at us to keep us from providing care because they wanted to make sure their rival gang member died. So I remember at one point yes. they issued us bulletproof vests and we were like, mm, that's not what we get paid for. <laughs> <laughs> so we would have to go and do, we would do what they call, we would, respond but we would stand by until police could come in and secure the scene Mm. and then we would try to render care and in phoenix during that time the fire chief actually had a meeting with the gang members and the gang leaders and said look we're just trying to provide care stop shooting when we show up we'll do what we call grab and go which you grab the person throw them on the stretcher throw them in the ambulance to take off and then y'all can keep shooting each other (laughs) But don't shoot at us because yeah. we have nothing. To, but that's people don't think about. That's the wow. kind of stuff we deal with. <laughs> and, and, and that amazing that in the culture we're in today that you have to have those negotiations, that oh, yeah. you have to have that type oh, yeah. of dialogue. But I, I guess in some ways it's better than not because more, more people get hurt. If yeah. you're not going, okay, this sounds really crazy that mm-hmm. we're having to negotiate with gang members. Mm-hmm. But – there's a lot of what's going on in those communities that creates that mm-hmm. environment. So yeah. how or, do you best work in it? Yeah. Or you sometimes huh. will pull up on scenes, you know, particularly the gunshot victims. We were always, you're wondering if the person's in the crowd. Mm-hmm. Um, certain areas we will pull in. If you're out there in the middle of the street and you're trying to work a person to bring them back and they're dying and the crowd is gathering and they're, they're talking, you know, trash, you Oof. know, so you had those type of situations you had to deal with. I mean, I've delivered yeah. a baby in the middle of Berkeley Avenue. Are you serious? Because the person was Berkeley sick. Avenue for those <laughs> who aren't in North. Yeah. That's downtown, downtown North. Norfolk. Norfolk. Yeah. Yeah. Person, Busy street. Yeah. Person was so so drugged out, didn't know they were in labor. Oh so my gosh. In the middle of the you know street delivering a baby. You know, beautiful yeah. baby. Amazingly, the baby was healthy. But I mean, it's just so much of societal of a societal problems impinge on us. As far as fire, we see the aftermath. We see the consequences yeah. of it. And regardless of, you know, your political agenda or what you feel about these matters, the bottom line is is that there's consequences that fire, EMS, and even police officers have to deal with because of these societal challenges that we have. Yeah. You know? So that, that brings me back to a book mm-hmm. that you wrote. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've got it here with me today. Um, 
And thank you for writing a book that I can read in, in one <laughs> evening. Now, I've got a Marine friend that I'm interviewing in, in August, and I, I had the books up here on the table before oh, the yeah, show. See, yeah, I see. You see those books. Yeah, it's pretty thick. <laughs> yeah, Travis, uh, thanks a lot. You've only given me like a month to read. Okay. Looks like probably 600 pages. Yeah. And I'm still working on Hooked on Phonics program, so, you know. <laughs> um, your book, Sisters in the Fire, the first African-American women firefighters. Yes. Um, Dr. Portia Rawls. Uh, folks can grab this book on Amazon. Yes, right on Amazon. And you self-publish, which I think is awesome mm -hmm. as well. I, I have a little book I wrote and, and, wrote and yeah. self-published, but... Um, it's it's a very interesting read, and Portia was kind to us. She could have written a lot more, but she made it a few, few hundred pages. Right? Yeah, I was told in today's society people don't like long books. Right. Yeah, so I, when I was getting ready to write it, my, one of the persons that I advised me on social media and just kind of what's going on in the world say, look, hey, long books are not it in this day and time. Yeah. You know, you need to, it needs to be short, quick. Kind of right. to the point, yeah. Get, get your point across. And, mm -hmm. and you. what I appreciate what you did is you honored the other ladies in yes. firefighting. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about a few of those stories in the book. I don't want you to give it all away because we do want <laughs> folks to, to, to okay. read it and support okay. you. Okay. Um, but one of the interesting things going back into early uh, fire companies and, and to give everyone a little history, I know a little bit about this being in the insurance history. business. Yes, yes. Um, that before there were fire departments that were funded by local cities mm -hmm. and municipalities, uh, fire companies were supported by local communities, mm -hmm. bureaus, mm -hmm. uh, um, and, and different um, counties that, or neighborhoods, I should yes. say. Mm -hmm. um, and then the fire insurance came in and said insurance companies came in and said well we'll issue a fire policy and we'll have this fire company who will serve your your block or mm -hmm. your neighborhood um but within that there there was one person in the book you were talking about early on um i don't want to do a disservice to to her name uh molly williams yes who was the first Af that we think was maybe the first African American? She's actually the first female firefighter that we have record of, and she wow. was a slave. And her owner served in the fire companies in New York. And he was a merchant of wealthy. Yeah, yeah, okay. And she served alongside. And this was New York City. New York City. Yeah. So we're thinking, as far as we can look, as, and, and I'm not a historian, but. Everybody's kind of say, hey, women's the first woman firefighter. Well, She's considered to be the first. She had cons also African-American, which I find interesting, but she was the yeah. first woman firefighter. Yeah. Wow. But it's interesting that you have her back there in that time, and then it took so many years for f women to actually enter the fire service. So what was the gap there that <sighs> you I'm found sure in your research? Um, I think it was not until like the early 1970s yeah. before women started coming into the fire service um and even then it was a lot of challenges wow. you know, so well so. i can imagine just in, in that environment you know being a prior marine and being an infantry mm -hmm. marine mm -hmm. there's still this mindset that y you don't put a, a woman on the battlefield mm -hmm. um and what i find interesting is that our, our friends in israel will put women in the battlefield Everybody and if you go back in history, uh, I think even back to Viking men, mm -hmm. they didn't want to put women in the battlefield. Oh, wow. You know why? Why? Because they were vicious. Okay. They were mean. You, you get a woman who's <laughs> uh, wanting to protect her baby, her family. Okay. That, that instinctual uh, protection mode comes out. And the men are like, well, wait a minute. You're a little more violent. Then okay, <laughs> I didn't know that. We, we, well, <laughs> the, the, and this is stuff that I've read. Uh -huh. Is is it factual? I don't know, but we'll okay. we'll say today that that okay. it is since we're yeah. doing the show. But uh, I I could I could see that I could understand that just from my wife of twenty seven years, five children. She is like, she's like the the mother lion. You mess with one of our babies, and Kathleen turns into a different woman. There you go, babe. I'm. <laughs> shout shout out the cat this morning. Okay, she is like the the protector of the herd. Okay. Um, 
And what's interesting about in fire service, you know, as a black African woman going into a field, especially in the time, you went in in the 1980s? Yeah, I went in in 19, let's see, I graduated from college in 86, and I went in in 87, so... I and was, why did you why did you join? Was it because <laughs> was, a lot of people join? Hey, I need a job. I, you know. Yeah, and you'll find that most African American women uh, you, in the book I talk about it. Most of us join because we needed a job. I, yeah. I wish I could give you some you know nice flowery story about. Deep, I was just really, called yeah, yeah. and all that. But to be honest with you, I had graduated from college and I had I was an art major. I was a studio art major. So throughout all of my college years, my professors yeah, we are digging up some new <laughs> stuff. On you. And my professor said. Just do whatever you can. Just make sure you can do your art. So I happened to hear that you only work nine days out the month in the fire service. <laughs> and I was like, okay, nine days. I got 21 days to paint and photograph. Great. Um, was working at a museum at the time. Did not like being indoors because all of my college career and high school, I had been an athlete. So I had you know, been training and working out and doing all that stuff and really just like being outside. So... I found out and heard that I could be off 21 days, and I said, that's the job for me. <laughs> I want a job like that, too. Can I be a fire? <laughs> and so um, – And that's still a, true today, right? Yes. It's, uh, the, Norfolk work – my department works what they call a seven-day – 20 21 seven-day cycle, which out of 21 days, you work seven days. So it earns, earns – you're on duty for 24 hours. So out of 30 days, you only work nine days a month. Do you know any history on that? Why that that type of work schedule? I don't know why. There's now starting to be some pushback because research is starting to say that 24-hour shifts for firefighters um, contributes to some of the difficulties with sleep and things that we have. Hmm. But um, I, they're going to be hard-pressed to change that because you think about it, you have 21 days off. Yeah, I and mean, most uh, have second. Firefighters have uh, landscapers, landscapers, yeah, landscapers, and all these. Yeah, they're gonna be hard pushed to change that, but yeah. um, there's some push to it. But I don't know the history behind it. But um, yeah, so that's how I applied. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I, I don't know why. I look back now at this age and go, "Did you think? Did you really?" I didn't think about. Okay, you're gonna be asked to run into a burning building. Yeah. <laughs> Not, yeah, I didn't think about that. Um, just thought about it. I thought I would like it. Um, it would be outdoors. So 1980s, uh, a, a, a woman, mm -hmm. a black woman, mm -hmm. joining the fire service. The fire service. Still. What What was the attitude then? Um, I was only I was the only second black woman to be hired in my department. I think I was only the, the, the I don't know what how many other women they had. It was only we were still single digits. But the attitude was that you don't belong. Hmm. Okay, you need to go find something else to do. Um, because you got to remember, the first African American woman was not hired to 1976. So we were still in that first wave of women. In Norfolk? In the nation. In the nation? Yeah. Okay. Wow. So we were, we're those that of, of us that were hired in the 70s and 80s are considered the first wave of African American women and still were the ones that kind of were the pioneers, although none of us ever asked for that title. Yeah. But um, yeah, I was. It was somewhat challenging in the academy when I got into the department. It was got into my station. It was even more challenging. But I can remember the first day I walked into class for the academy and the Emmy. It went yeah. silent. Like, what are you doing here? <laughs> you know, you. I mean, everybody wow. stopped talking when I walked in the door. And even through in my hiring process, I quickly was the realized, prejudice because you were black, or was the prejudice because you were female or is it a combination i think it was a combination but i think for more foremost because i was a female and then adding african-american on top of that mm. okay how many how many black men were firefighters in time, the 1980s um i don't know the percentage nationwide but in my department we had a we had maybe about eight or nine still very little wow and my department was under the consent decree at that time and the consent decree. Yeah, consent decree is when the feds say, okay, you've been discriminating, and you need to make a concerted effort to diversify your race. Yeah. Okay. And and in that, educate me here, because I, I think I understand the consent decree. But So let's say if our, our population is made up of 13% mm -hmm. blacks, and I forget what the Hispanic rate yeah. is, but you know whites make up 60, 70-some percent of, of 
Mm-hmm. Are they saying try to bring that in line to what our, our population looks like? It depends on the... the or is it partic- more locale, like more city? More locale, and it depends on the particulars of the consent decree. So, for instance, I remember, because I wrote about it, because one of the firefighters... Yeah, I, I thought I remember seeing yeah. that in there. In Louisiana, they had to do a 50, and I think in Florida, they had to do a 50-50 hire. So, if you hired 50... and Unfortunately, during that time, it was more of a black and white issue. Right. And male and fee. So if you hire 50% males, then you had to hire 50% women. So it depends on the particulars of the consent decree. But in Norfolk, they have found that there have been a consistent practice of not hiring women and um, African Americans. And it, and it was shown that it was not because you couldn't find any that were qualified. Mm. It was just a, a systematic effort to make sure that they didn't get in the department. Yeah. So unfortunately, when I came through, they were talking, we had to do, all five departments have this thing called a physical agility test. <laughs> and um, you have to do all of these physical actions and you pass the test and that's one part of the hiring process. So at the time that I was being hired, there was an effort to say the physical agility testing had a disparate a- impact upon women, which means that certain things they were being asked Um, unfairly discriminated against women. And the one thing was what they called the dummy carry, which I talk about it in the book, which I laugh Mm. about it. I even laughed about it when I was in the I was hoping you would bring this up. Yeah, where they would require you to carry this. It was like a 100, 110-pound dummy. Put it on your back and carry it inside the building up two flights of steps. And I always say, in all of my years in the fire service, I never had to carry anybody into a Bernie building. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) But that was what you had to do to get on. And that was the one thing that would knock women out. Yeah. And so... On. Was that test there before? Well, see, I go back to the history of physical agility. No, okay. when women started coming into the, the fire service, the, the fire service, decide, first they had hyphen weight requirements that were based on men's physical structure. So okay. if you weren't this hyphen, this, you couldn't get in. Yeah. So the feds said, ah, that's illegal. You can't. <laughs> yeah. You can't make a case for that. So then after that, they started introducing physical agility tests. So... They say now, the, the, the argument now in the fire service, where these are to make sure that we're hiring the most fit people and ensure, you know, minimize injuries and all of that. My take, and, and I'm probably going to get some flack, is that it's still a mechanism for keeping women out of the fire service. Because when you go through the academy, the running, it's like yeah. boot camp. Yeah. You will yeah, be we've in talked shape. About it. Yeah, right. <laughs> when you, you know, if you're not in shape before you come in, you will be. All right, so so Joe Rogan, mm-hmm. who has a podcast that I love and I listen to mm-hmm. often, shout out to to okay. JRE and his. Now he a lot of people don't like Joe because you know he's a little controversial <laughs> okay. and, but he brought up something the other day. I was listening uh, to this podcast with um, Ian. What was it, Jeremy Lindsay, the guy he was, mm, I think so, yeah. or James Lindsay, James maybe uh, uh, another PhD, mm-hmm. you okay. know, talking about the the woke. Yeah. Environment. Well, I want to talk to you about that a little today, but he brought an MMA, so mixed martial arts. Okay. And he brought it back to the LBGTQ plus Mm -hmm. environment Mm -hmm. of where now you have some transgender Mm -hmm. um, women, Mm -hmm. a trans woman who would want to fight a biological female. Yeah. That's a big debate now. And he's mm-hmm. like, N- no. And he says, if I have to die on this hill, I die on this hill. And I kind of get it because mm-hmm. um, you were an athlete in college. Mm-hmm. I was an athlete, college dropout. All right. But if you put a trans woman up against a woman in his argument, um, there are many, many more instances where that trans woman is going to beat the living hell mm-hmm. out of that woman in the ring just because of stature, size, makeup. And he went down the hip structure, and he, he's a lot more detailed than what I could do, what I could serve on the show today. And, and speak speak to that for me in terms of – so when we get – when you get into Pandora's box of that and you start having – conversation and debate um and i i understand having guidelines and i'm going to give you my position mm-hmm. before you you share yours and you can educate me and <laughs> enlighten me but my mindset would be have a test 
and have a test that's realistic to the job set. Mm -hmm. Like, would you want me given, um, with the education I have in finance, would you want me giving, uh, would you hire me? No, <laughs> in my mental health practice. In your mental no, health. No. Yeah, you're like, no, <laughs> Kenny, you're not touching my patient. Yeah. <laughs> but there would be a guideline that you would say, okay, you have to pass mm-hmm. these tests and, and you have to have these guidelines mm-hmm. before you get there. Mm-hmm. Do you think the test for fire service specifically is fair for everyone? Well, they have and temp- fair is such a oh, weird yeah. word. They have attempted to make it fair. They They went through and they actually brought in some organizational psychology and when I say they like the IAF which is the union labor union over yeah. for the fire service and they came up with what they call the CPAT which is and it was is that an acronym for something yeah and I can't remember don't ask me what the acronym because we call it CPAT I'll have right? these guys fact okay but C-P-A-P C-P-A-T CPAT CPAT mm-hmm. CPAT it's in the t- yeah, okay it's in it's in the book. okay um and they had it standardized and they you know they had a Norm, a normative group that was somewhat representative. Okay. And so they stated that, okay, this is going to be the test for the fire service. Um, but it's still up to departments to voluntarily accept that particular test. And it allows you to go and practice. So where it used to be, you could then have that option. So if you want to come into a fire department that has adopted the CPAT, physical agility testing, they allow you to practice. They got away from acquiring you to wire, wear fire gear, which was, you know, you have to learn how to operate in fire gear. Okay. okay? Um, and you wear, tend to wear a weighted vest. You know, some departments require that simulates the weight of fire gear. Like having the tank on you. And, yeah, and yeah. all that. Because gear has gotten a lot um, lighter. And, but yeah. in my time, you had added about 40 to 50 pounds extra on you when you put on wow. fire gear. So, um so that is a much improved, and I give them that credit. But always look at the foundation of stuff. Yeah. Because foundation determines the health of whatever you build. Mm, yeah. Okay? So my, the foundation of physical agility, its intent was to try to prevent women from coming into the fire service. So my question is, what is the happy media? I don't think you should just be hiring anybody and the person that's, you know, eating donuts and they're like 90 pounds overweight. Right. <laughs> okay. But in the same, so the question is, how do we create a balance? So that was there. That was the fire yeah. service answer. But I still ask, you know, is the foundation, based on the foundation or origin of this, do we really need this, or do we really need to say, okay, you're qualified in every way to come into the fire service. You're going to start the academy on this particular day. You need to be in this level of shape by yeah. the time you walk in this door. We're going to get you in better shape. Basically, yeah. what we're going to do, but you need to be at this physical level by the time we get you into, by the time you walk through that door. So, in your opinion, should there be a male standard, female standard, or just a standard? They just have a standard. Yeah. Um, mm, I, I, I like the idea they just have a standard. Yeah. Um, but there's some who still don't agree with that. Yeah. On both sides of yeah, the aisle. that's true. But I, I really wish that we, and to be honest with you, in the fire service, I almost feel like the greater, I, we can get you in shape. That's the easy yeah. part. What I'm finding, the challenge, they are having a hard time trying to identify people to who, are, who are emotionally equipped to deal with the trauma and the stress that they're going to experience on this job. Yeah. And to me, the the... Energy needs to be put in figuring out a process. So for that. interesting that you say that because, mm-hmm. it, and I, I have to be careful what I say about my son who's serving in the army and mm-hmm. he's he's doing some high speed stuff. We'll mm-hmm. put it at that. Uh-huh. And the conversations I've had with him is that most people aren't quitting the program that he's in because they're not physically mm-hmm. adaptive. Mm-hmm. It's they're not mentally mm-hmm. adaptive, yeah. and it's the silly stuff like. Standing out in the formation for six hours on a pile of rocks, Mm -hmm. doing nothing, Mm -hmm. just complete boredom. You know, the old military hurry up and wait. Yeah. And and some guys who are like the studs, you know, workout PT Mm -hmm. dudes, physically fit, but mentally not prepared to be bored. Oh, yeah. There is so much. I, I 
I have met so many people over the years in the forest. I'm going to say many, but quite a number that if I had met them before they came in, I would have told them to go do something else. Interesting. Not because they weren't good at the skills that you have to learn for fire EMS, not because they weren't physically fit, but psychologically, I would have told them this is not the place, mm -hmm. the job for you. So when it comes to psychological testing, help, help me with this, and I'm going to ask mm -hmm. the doctor now, not the <laughs> okay. firefighter. Okay. So I can remember 27 years ago, I took a Myers-Briggs test, the personality test, to enter the financial services industry. Mm -hmm. And my mentor then, uh, who uh, subsequently hired me uh, to work for his firm, I failed the test as far as what the parameters were for the institutions that we would be working with. Um, he said, look, Kenny, you, you, don't, you didn't pass this Myers-Briggs personality test to be in the financial services industry. And he half wittedly joke and I don't I still to this day I should ask him should have him on the show he was like I don't believe in those tests anyway mm -hmm. and he said I'm going to give you a shot to do it and I'm going to give you a time frame to do it in so do you think sometimes I, I obviously made it 27 years in the business I'm here today and you know thank you for that opportunity to my mentor um I'll go ahead and tell Ron Dukes thank you Ron for Helping me, you know, giving me a shot. I appreciate that. Um, but so many people get passed sometimes because of maybe the environment. The time they took the test, mentally they weren't what, prepared. Yeah, so help, help me understand how these profiles work. Yeah, so psychological testing is not a 100% exact science. So you can get people that are weeded out maybe that should have been. And that, and what you It's kind of like medicine going to your doctor, yeah. right? Your doctor yeah. can't always diagnose yeah. first shot. So that's what you just described is a challenge. And, and that's what the a lot of, not just fire service, but a lot of employment industries are dealing with. With the fire service, go, what do we design that has a good success rate that's going yeah. to identify people who will work well with this job? What are the characteristics? And then... How do you deal with the lawsuits when people say, <laughs> hey, I mean, but that's the conversation. Yeah. So we designed this wonderful process, but then you have people saying, well, that test is discriminatory because of this right. or whatever. So, so that is the challenge. But there needs to be, and I just talked to a union president not too long ago, a couple of days. I'm like, yo, you guys need to sit down as an organization and hire yeah. some mental health providers and bring us to the table and say, what, do, what are the characteristics that makes a good person not just able to, but psychologically able to survive yeah. the job? Because you're getting, we're getting too many people that are being damaged mm. by the job. You know, they stay in a couple of years. And it used to be in the fire service, you, people would almost die on the job. You know, wow. they would retire. But now there's just turnaround, five, six, seven yeah. years, and people are like, I'm done. Our military is going through that now where yeah. there's a high rate of suicide, mm -hmm. and they're having to go back and restudy yeah. what, why is this happening. Mm -hmm. um, so it is needed because we're having, you know, and things are getting – more, I just say, more challenging in the streets. Yeah. And so um, you need people that mentally, because then it has a fall, let me, it has a fallout effect on the families and on the community. So you see a high divorce rate among firefighters and police, mm. <laughs> all this in front of public safety. Mm -hmm. um, then you have this whole issue of how that impacts the community as families are breaking up and divorcing, and it just has this, you know, snowball effect. And it's an honorable profession. I love being a firefighter yeah. would not have I would not have traded I would not I don't regret going into the fire service but the sadness is that such an honorable profession can have such a profound effect upon a person yeah yeah so I think this goes back we saw this happen in uh in the NBA like with a guy like Kevin Love and some of the other um folks in professional sports who came out and said look I I actually struggle. I actually have some mental illness mm -hmm. issues that I'm dealing with and good on them to be able to, to be the role model in mm -hmm. saying, Hey, it's okay to talk about things that aren't going well in your life. Mm -hmm. It, you know, we live in this culture now where Instagram, Facebook and all, you know, Everything's not, not Twitter, Twitter's like hate universe, but, 
Uh, sorry, Twitter. Um, but, you know, an Instagram, I, I call Instasham and Face Lies. Okay. okay. You know, we, we put out this image, and we're in this image culture, my, especially my younger kids and yes. his friends. It's this clout culture. Mm-hmm. You know, how much clout can we get? How much recognition can we get? Uh, how many follows can we get? Mm-hmm. And it's created this environment that we have to live up to the image that we've made of ourselves. Um, and, and I think that creeps into, in some cases, pro- professional worlds like uh, oh, firefighting, yeah. police departments. You and know, and the fire service is, they are hard animal. They're big on tradition. Yeah. So there is a statement. It used to be 100 years when I was in. There's 150. I think it's going up to 200. They have a statement in fire service. 200 years of tradition unimpeded by progress. And yeah. they wear that proudly on their T-shirts. So I, I got to <laughs> and, and, and knowing, okay. knowing your background mm-hmm. um, and knowing you and mm-hmm. being able to get to know you a little bit over the mm-hmm. last few weeks and, and working with you, um, I went after the Marine Corps um, uh, about – uh, three weeks ago on my Instagram, you can go look it up, and I'm I'm pro- and I don't want anybody to get me wrong with this. I I, I believe in an individual's right to choose mm-hmm. across the board. Um, I have some religious beliefs, I have some cultural beliefs, mm-hmm. right, wrong, or indifferent. But the Marine Corps um, celebrated uh, the "Don't Ask, Don't Tell" policy, okay, and they published that on their their Marine Corps page, mm-hmm. and. I, I was a little offended by it, not because of a person's right to choose, but what I was offended by was for my son. So my son, Isaiah, went to go enlist in the Marine Corps and follow in his father's footsteps, tradition. This is what made yeah. me think of this to share it with you today. And I, I would love your okay. your professional insight. So, so pro, <laughs> help me today with my psych, psychological makeup okay. right here on camera. Um, boy, this is awkward, um, putting myself out here. Yeah, that's what a psychologist and, and <laughs> clinical uh, professional can do to someone. Right? Okay. Um, so, anyways, I digress. Uh, so, I, I made a post. I, you know, they were celebrating diversity and they were celebrating your right to choose. And I was like, hey, that's awesome. But in this culture that we're in today where you, you gave this opportunity, and I thought it was politics, mm-hmm. not that they really cared about a person's right to choose, okay. Marine Corps, I'm calling you out. Okay. Um, but they said, hey, we, we want to celebrate Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Mm-hmm. I said, okay, no, no issue with that. And uh, opening up this world to allow all people in and have a, a chance at meeting the, the requirements mm-hmm. of being a being able to be called a Marine. Okay. But my son's individuality, my son's diversity, and I know this is really hard for me being a, a, a white man in this world today mm-hmm. to be able to say this, but here's, here's my point I'm getting at. What they, what they did to my son was said, you cannot enlist in the Marine Corps. You cannot be a Marine. Physically, mentally, fits the guidelines. But guess what was wrong with him? What? He had individuality. He had tattoos. Oh, the tattoo thing. That Yeah, <laughs> that was too far down on his arm. Oh, yeah. And literally, it was a half inch. And I'm like, okay, well, I served honorably in the Marine Corps. I didn't get in any trouble. I was a good Marine. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have some, some people in, in uh, high places who maybe could help him get a waiver. Mm-hmm. And I respect the fact they said no. But I said, in one instance, you're celebrating a political thought mm-hmm. of, of a person's diversity and right to choose. But my son had individuality and had some tattoos on his arms. And they said, no, you cannot be in our club. You cannot be in, in, in our group. But over here, because this is a political hot topic right now, mm-hmm. Um, w- we're going to say that you can come in, but you can't. Isn't that a form of prejudice? Isn't that a form of exclusion? But if you can meet all the tests and if you can pass all the exams, but you've put some ink on you that doesn't fit the guideline. The guidelines. That's how, a tough how do we? One. And so I'm talking to the good doctor today. <laughs> 
I wouldn't say, you know, they would say, oh, it's our policy and regs, but then you have to go ask your question, are the policy and regs discriminatory? So <laughs> it's a tough question to answer. What I, f what I feel like we're struggling here in America, not just with that issue, mm -hmm. but everything, is that we tend to be an either or culture. Either or, yeah. Either this or that. We are not a culture that can do both and very well. Yeah. So uh, and so you say, well, what does that have to do with anything? Because you get these exclusive policies. If you're this, then yes. If you're that, no. Instead of, about, okay, what about both and? If you're this, okay. And if you're that, yeah, we may have to tell you to make some changes, like go get your tattoos, scrape yeah. off or something. Yeah. But I think what's driving all of the discord and the division is that we're evil or in this country. Hmm. It's, we feel like if we choose one thing, then that other it automatically is a is an opposition or protest towards the other thing. Yeah, and and in most cultures, what you find over in Europe and some of the other cultures, they tend to be both in. They can hold two competing ideas. Yeah, and two competing communities and understand that just because I'm ch maybe choosing this at the moment doesn't mean I'm going to exclude this other community. Yeah. And we don't we don't do that very well here in the United States. Right. Okay. And that so was my point to the Marine Corps. Yeah. I was like you you got to go back and review your policy once again. again. and say why would you exclude someone who's fit in every other way other than they got some ink? Okay, yeah. why not say okay, well, if you have And it ink, wasn't a, it was <laughs> ink for individual like I have a tattoo here uh -huh. 275 uh -huh. that and by the way, this is very close to from the Marine Corps standard, mm -hmm. if I had this today and I was wanting to go enlist, I'd have to get a waiver. Okay. Isaiah couldn't get a waiver because his was too low. Yeah, so my question is, and then we tend to, in our culture in the United States, all or nothing. Yeah. We don't we do not do flexibility. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, you have to understand this because then it plays out in our policies and then we how we carry out their policies. We don't do flexibility well and we... Yeah. We like things nice and neat, which is it's, it's some advantages to that. We want one answer for everything. Right. So if this is problem A, then this answer here is going to solve it all the time for problem A. Right. That's part of our culture. Yeah, which goes back to that personality profile test. It's, and so it's a guideline. In your son's case, okay, so you're going to have all these kids. And in this younger generation, their bodies are their canvas. Right. That's how they see it. So they got tattoos. Yeah, an expression of who they, they are. are. <laughs> I mean, that's, the, that's how they think. So, all right, if that, we know that. We know there's a cultural shift here. So how do we create some flexibility in our yeah. policy? Yeah. And we don't do that well as a country. So as a, as a firefighter. Mm hmm and as a a black woman who came up through the ranks of the fire industry um and knowing where we are in 2020 with some of the cultural divide and and infighting in communities and states and democrats and republicans and things like defund the police um mm -hmm. what would what would your statement or answer to uh the community at large not just the black community not just the white community but if you were talking to people what what would your answer what would your and I, not, your professional answer that that someone who's been educated who's had opportunities to think about things from a um psychological point of view getting into the gray matter how how would you help people who say we need to defund police. We just need to do away with law enforcement. Okay, so I'm going I'm to say a couple of things. I don't agree with the defund. I think that's a misnomer. I understand what people are trying to say. There needs to be more options when we call 911. I do agree with that. Yeah. Um, because I just know from my police officer friends, and even I have relatives, one of the worst things, they are not equipped to deal with just a simple psychiatric. They go to a psychiatric mm -hmm. emergency, but they're really not. Their training does not. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, deal with that. OK. Right. But I think a couple of things. First of all, I, unfortunately, I think we're reaping the, found, the consequences of the foundation that America has laid as far as their history. Yeah. You know, I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. I don't have a problem saying that. And there's there's something it says the truth will set you free. Now, people take mm. that when you on the pulpit, you talk about scripture. <laughs> 
But I really believe that has a more universal meaning. When you're truthful and honest, yeah. there's a level of freedom that happens yeah. in, your wor- in your life. That's good. So I don't feel like we've been honest and truthful about our history. Yeah. I believe that we need to literally teach all of our history, the good and bad and ugly, because it's made us who we are. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's the first problem, that you have people that really don't know what does slavery mean for this country? What did Reconstruction, Jim Crow, what did the Confederate reflect? We don't we right. don't have those honest, open conversations. It's not taught in our school systems. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I believe if we had laid that foundation, we wouldn't have as many of the problems as we have. Yeah. Okay. Germany does it. South Africa does it with apartheid. Yeah. But we haven't done it. Yeah. That's the first thing, I think. As far as defunding the police, I think we need to take a look at the origins. I'm, I'm big, and you that running theme, I'm big on foundation. Mm. The origins of police departments in the United States. In the South, the police departments came out of the slave, mm. um, the night watches, and the slave patrols. Oh, wow. Most people don't understand that. Before there was police, there were the slave patrols, and then they morphed into what we now know as police departments. Mm. So the origin of that thing <laughs> was I'm policing a group of people who I consider less human. Okay. Okay. And I got to keep them under control because they they are a commodity. Let's just be, I mean, yeah. people no, don't want to, but <laughs> okay. So how we do need to do this, this more. more. Talk, yeah, talk. Educate. So then how do we change that mindset yeah. that has come up through all of these years yeah. that has laid the foundation of law enforcement? So, you know, I don't think there needs to be reform. I don't think, I believe there needs to be transformation. Yeah. Okay. Um, and transformation requires transparency. transparency. And you turn kind of like, okay, yeah. this is not working. Let's see how we can reinvent the wheel yeah. here. But, but can we, do, do you think we've gone too far in our country to be able for a, a black woman and a white man, let, let's celebrate <laughs> that we can sit so, in a room today and talk. And talk. And no, we're going to disagree about some things, but that's okay. Right. But I don't think there has to be honest conversation. And I don't know. I believe it would start in the school systems with teaching our history, honestly. But at this point in time, for my age and your age, I mean, those conversations are starting to happen on a societal level. But the, I know the police feel like they're under assault because I have FBI agent friends and I yeah. have, you know, all of those friends. But I think. What needs to happen is the transformation. There needs to be more options for for us to call other than the police. Uh, police, unfortunately, are called for, to deal with everything, almost like social workers, their yeah. counselor, their therapist. So for me, the defunding, but I know everybody doesn't hear that, means can we allocate some resources? Yeah. I think, unfortunately, the police, have, and I know I'm going to get some flack on this, have become too militarized. Yeah. But then you, I also have the other side that I'm well aware they well, have do you gains. think that happened because of 9-11? Some of 9-11, but then you had a time where you had gangs and these that had really high-powered weaponry right. that they were outgunned. Just yeah. put it plainly, okay, <laughs> you know, you showing up with a, a 9 mil <laughs> and they've got 762, the yeah, revolution oh, weapon, was, right? Yeah. They're AK-47. But so. I think it has maybe gone a little bit too far. Yeah. And I find it, I always ask myself, and I haven't read enough to find the answer, but, you know, overseas they call them peace officers. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. So I've, I was at this conference with my wife in Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. and, there was, and it's been transformative for Kathleen and I, like in our marriage, and I think it can be applied beyond, mm-hmm. you know, marriage is work. It is serious okay. work, and you you have to choose love. Mm-hmm. Sometimes love mm-hmm. is not; it's not the infatuation that you have when yeah. you fall in love with someone, mm-hmm. or you know, have this massive infatuation. Yeah, it's uh, about after about three years, right? And then you're like, "Oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> what happened?" Um, but there's this pastor in Philadelphia, mm-hmm. um, Bishop Joseph Garlington. I've heard of him. Yeah, he's super. I would I would tell folks, you know, go, go listen listen to the good bishop. He's he's got some great words. Mm-hmm. Uh, black man in Philadelphia in his seventies who's grown. I probably shouldn't have told his age. There, he's be mad at me. <laughs> okay. um, but has grew up in in some different times, right? Mm-hmm. Than what young men. And one of the comments you made in your book is uh, was building off of the shoulders of, of a, what you're pioneering. Mm-hmm. 
And and pioneers either become heroes or dead. Yes. Right. You think about pioneers who went west. Yeah. There's a lot of them that aren't in history books because they didn't get to tell their story. Yeah. Those who made it got to tell their side of the story. Yeah. But Bishop Garlington said, you know, when you have conflict, when you're angry with your wife, and I think this could be, if I have conflict with you, mm-hmm. um, am am I going to die on a hill of being right? Or am I going to bring that person to my hill or me go to their hill and be reconciled? Oh, yeah. So you're talking about restorative justice, what they did in South Africa. Mm. The world thought they were crazy. Yeah. So when they ended apartheid, they said, okay, if we don't figure out a way to bring healing, our nation will never be able. And, and you know, they still have their issues. Sure. But our nation will never recover from this period of history. So what they did was they brought all of the government officials and law enforcement who was, you know, killing people and taking them out of their houses at night, and they said, you will not be punished. Mm. You will not get any kind of criminal, but you have to tell the truth to these family members of what happened to their loved one that night that you took them out. Wow. Wow. And you have to tell the absolute truth, and you have to answer whatever questions, truthfully and honestly, Mm. of what happened that they asked. And they went through that process. They had restorative justice mm. circles. Mm. So it was a way of them, con- you know, really yeah. being honest. But what you're talking, and that's a part of what you're yeah. saying, okay, let's not see who can win because it's a competition. And that's kind of what we're getting yeah. to in the U.S. But, yes, let's see if we can come to some understanding. Um, but how do, we, how do we keep nefarious people out of that conversation? Nef- and I say nefarious people – let's let's pick on Antifa for a minute and go, okay. all right, there are some people who want to take this dialogue that we're having and maybe they'll pull a clip out and oh, go, yeah. oh, look at what Kenny said to Portia or look, look at what, what Portia, Portia said to Kenny mm-hmm. versus seeing it for what it is, which is the context of, of that conversation, the context of being a firefighter um, and having a guideline that you follow regardless of whether you're black, white, lesbian, straight, trans, yeah. just can you pass the test? I think, can you pass well, the litmus test? I, the thing I, that I think we need to realize in all societies, there's going to be hate groups, whether yeah. it's Antifa, whether it's Ku Klux Klan, whether it's, I don't know, all of the different <laughs> neo-Nazis. There's yeah. always, even in Germany with what they've done, there's still Nazism there. Oh, okay, massive. massive. And it's coming back. Back, yeah. okay. But I think if you have a louder voice of those who are trying to heal and reconcile and just tr- be understanding of different points of view. If you can make that voice louder, then yeah. it drowns out the hate. But you're going to always have the hate group. Some of it is because they truly believe whatever yeah. their beliefs are. And, s- and, you know, in some cases, it's prof- division is profitable. Yeah. And that, you know, that's, that's a whole another conversation. Co- <laughs> that's a whole another conversation. We got, we got seven <laughs> minutes to talk about that. Um, well, it's, it's interesting you say that because – We've got friends in Paris, mm-hmm. um, a family in Paris that we're, we've known for years. And we were talking with the family and the daughters who are my, my kids' age in their 20s. They have friends who believe, who radically believe that there was no Holocaust. Oh, yeah. And, and <laughs> I just, I go, I go, wow. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, I believe that there are things that's happened in history that weren't documented appropriately mm-hmm. and accurately mm-hmm. but that happened go ask the russians you know more so than even the the jews who lost what not nine million yeah russians lost 60 million and people go why do we think the russians are still mad today <laughs> and and why do we think there are black americans who feel taken advantage of or feel yeah. um uh mistreated it's because there there is a story there there is a dialogue that needs to happen in our society my 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 concern is Porsche is that folks today citizens today are not willing to sit down and, and have a tough conversation and uh Tom Friedman talks about it in his book The Lexus and the Olive Tree hmm. um that he calls he calls it systematic misunderstanding hmm. that we're so um set on giving our point and given our thesis that we're not willing to to hear and listen. And I, a few weeks ago, a person on Facebook 
had made this comment is that if you had um if you had 15 minutes uh, i think it was 15 if you had 15 minutes to say what you wanted to say to the world and you had the world might what would you say and i i really i thought about that a little while before i responded and and some of the training that i got is it, it kind of goes back to the mindset of well what if i took 13 minutes to listen mm-hmm. and 2 minutes to speak that i think the overwhelming majority of people want to tell you their opinion um and and tell you what's wrong mm-hmm. versus listening and then going okay i think if we listen enough we'll find some commonality in in what we're saying is wrong mm-hmm. and in your world as a professional uh clinical psychologist um and am i saying yes. that right mm-hmm. yeah. Your job is you're taught if and please correct me if I'm wrong is to ask lots of questions. No, <laughs> we <laughs> ask some, but we're taught to listen. So one of the biggest when you ask the question, uh, here I go. I'm talking mm-hmm. too much talk, mm-hmm. but you're asking those questions and then you're listening mm-hmm. without massive interruption. Without massive interruption, and we're also trained to sit with people in their silence, mm-hmm. which is one of to sit with people in their pain, which is the hardest thing, I think, for a clinical psychologist to train, to be able to do, but also to sit in the silence with that person and to not have to fill it with us babbling. Yeah. And and that's a critical skill, as a, even whether you're a psychologist or counselor, that you have to develop. And it kind of goes back, you know, to Native American culture. You know, Native American mm. culture values sitting in silence. Mm. You know, they they don't consider that just wasted time. The Native Americans, if you go back and study, it's pretty, pretty, <laughs> pretty cool yeah. cats, right? You know, they feel that there's a value to that, yeah. um, tremendous value. So I, I agree with you that we tend to talk more than we listen. Um, but I also, I really believe that for us, and I also believe that as Americans in this earlier generation, at now we're not taught as, as much as we should to think and to analyze and to cr- critically consume and consider things. Hmm. When I was an undergrad, um, and I went to a very good university, and they did not have... Just Soybrook University? No, that's where you teach. I teach, but I attended attended Stanford. I say that. I give Stanford, I give them their plug. But one of the things that blew my mind when I went there um, was that the professors would tell us, we are not, we don't want you to be concerned about grades. Hmm. Matter of fact, they wanted to do away with grades, but they said so many of us was going to graduate school, they thought that might be problematic for us. They said, we want to train you to think. Because if we can train you and teach you how to think, then everything, whatever you want to accomplish, whatever you want to achieve, whatever you're trying to do, you're more likely to be successful. They spent a lot of time. Think and grow rich. (laughs) Yeah, I've read that. Napoleon Hill. Yeah, Yeah. but they would put a lot of, it was welcome for you to debate the professors. Hmm. And they didn't consider it, you know, you being this arrogant little kid yeah. that's trying to tell me who I'm an expert in my field. But they welcome debate. They welcome you challenging them. Matter of fact, the teaching process at the time when I was there was more Socratic. Hmm. Okay, so it wasn't that I'm going to just, you know, give you this yeah. information and you absorb it and you regurgitate it back to me. You had to really be a critical consumer. And I don't know if we do that that much anymore in education. So critical thinking does require critical debate, though. Mm-hmm. And oh, yeah. it seems like at the university level. I don't know th- if that's – that's. I know where we teach, we, we inspire that and we try to emphasize that. But I don't know if that's the approach we're taking anymore. And mm-hmm. I'm not an educator, so I won't pretend to be an expert. But I don't know if that's the standard approach throughout the university, academic arena here in America, or even down on the lower grade levels. Wow. Yeah. So – Fr- from your point of view, and the you and I can affect our worlds, right? Mm-hmm. The world that we live in. You and thank you so much for coming on today and having an open dialogue with me mm-hmm. and uh, allowing me to. I, I want to have you back on a on another show if we can do that, and okay. we'll talk more because I think it's it's needed. Okay. And you know, this is a show about everything from oxygen to money. Okay. We didn't really get to spend <laughs> a lot of time today on money <laughs> and your business, yeah. but. Um, you know, just sharing your story, and and please go read uh, Portia's book here on uh, women 
in the fire industry. <laughs> um, it's pretty interesting. And this book, real quick, share a little bit about uh, um, this was your first book. Yeah, and that yeah. is looking at trauma among in the church. Among, oh wow! Among, among women and how that trauma and I, that book is a combination. I call it psycho spiritual because I kind of combined I um, integrated spirituality uh, from a Christian perspective. But the second edition, I made it more global and psychology, and looking at how how does that play out among women and how does it you know when there's certain traumas they've experienced in their lives mm. and what this what the scripture have to say about that, but also. How do you go about getting healed from it? My sister said, I'm a PK, I'm a preacher's kid. Mm -hmm. She said she was going to write a book one day about how to be a preacher's kid oh, and yeah. still go to heaven. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, could, I, yeah that's, I think that's a much-needed book. So that's what that book's about. Um, it's really a how-to. You can literally take that book, because I got work areas where you write down questions, you answer. You can literally take that book and walk through a lot of your traumas and things you've dealt with in your life. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So um, today in your practice um, and, and trying to help people heal mm -hmm. mentally, what, what are you seeing as the biggest issue in mental health today? Trauma. Wow. And all types? All types. All types. From wor work-related trauma? From work to school to community to family. Uh, we tend to think of trauma as just, you know, I got in a vehicle accident, I went to war, or um, I was sexually assaulted, but trauma from poverty, trauma from um, dysfunctional family relationships. It's just trauma is far broader than that, and what I'm seeing is that you have people that go through all of these events, and then they don't realize the impact it's had on them emotionally and psychologically, and they start making, I say doing life, but, they st but to get more specific, they start making decisions yeah. out of that uh, woundedness, which is what the book that book was about. Yeah. And they don't realize, and they create this life, and they create this environment, and they create relationships that have a foundation of woundedness. Yeah. It really is about peeling back your own onion, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And that's, people don't want to get down to the core of who they are because um, it's it can be painful and it can be tough. You gotta you gotta face some demons, so to speak. That it's tough, but you know, I wouldn't even say people are not willing. What I find in the practice is most people don't even realize. Mm. Like I'm talking, uh, we have clients come in and they're telling us they're struggling with all of these things, and then they're just casually saying, "Oh, by the way, I was sexually molested from the ages of four to 10. And I'm looking at them like. You know, I have to keep my yeah. called therapist face, but uh, and, but they p make no connection with that experience to who they are. Interesting. And it's not just women; it's yeah. men, it's children. But I'm amazed that, you know, bef now everybody's trauma informed. But you know, many years ago when I came out of school, I started specializing. We didn't have the term trauma informed. But I'm amazed at how people really don't make the connection that these events have changed or shaped the trajectory of my life hmm. and I'm still struggling because of the impact of these events so it's pretty rewarding and not just me but all the therapists in our office we talk about this yeah. but it's pretty rewarding for us to see when we help them to deal with the impact and get healed from that the how yeah. they start making different life choices and their life begins to bloom and they begin to live again you know. So I have this saying, I think I've shared it with you in the past, um, just in my own practice and, and helping people through financial therapy and the, mm -hmm. some of the past experiences they have have a big effect on the money decisions they make today mm -hmm. or even the good things they do. You got to embrace where that came from. Yeah. The bad behavior you have, where did that come from? But, uh, you know, I talk about it as uh, you're, in, you know, as a money expert what I tried to focus on is money and I try not to get in your field, but in your field uh, and my principles that I use in my firm is a, a, as an example with money, a money belief drives the money behavior. Mm. So I would take that back to a past belief mm -hmm. probably drives a present behavior. Absolutely. And if we can't get comfortable uh, with our, our past belief systems, mm -hmm. um, it, it's going to be really hard moving 
through that behavior relationship ultimately result? Yeah, because what happens with those experiences is they you get messages about yourself, about the world, about other people that are recorded within mm. you. And when you hit certain situations, the play button hits automatically, and you don't oh, that's realize good. it. And so, you know, and you ask me, what else am I seeing? So we have people that are dealing with their own personal, individualized traumas that they've dealt with. And then we're in this national trauma of COVID-19. Yeah. And so <laughs> you got trauma sitting within trauma. Right. So a lot of people are getting activated and triggered, and they don't understand why, because they're not in a community you know, where it's where you got the protests and the, tr you know, COVID-19, all this stuff going. On. They don't understand why they're having all this anxiety. They just want to go in the house and close the door. Yeah. But it's all this other stuff that they've never dealt with. I, is it true? And, and help me with this. I've said it and it's kind of been one of the, the mantras I had. And, and it drives my wife crazy sometimes. I go, you know, when I start complaining, I have to stop and I have to be reflective of what am I complaining about? Mm -hmm. Most of the things that I've found in life that we complain about, we actually can change. I would, I would agree with that. Okay. I oh, agree. Man, I am so... <laughs> yeah. I could, yeah. To a point, yeah. Um, now, now, it may not be... Yeah. What most of us want is this farming mentality of we want to plant a seed and we want to immediately harvest. Okay. And, and what I've found that in our society today, this instant gratification society, and we can't just blame our, our, our kids and young people for this, we're, we're guilty too, is we've been in this environment, especially in the last 20 years, that, man, if, if I do X, Y is going to be the result pretty short. I, I can put a picture on Instagram and within a few minutes have these hearts pop up that people like my oh, yeah. picture. So That's we get validated mm -hmm. immediately. And there's a whole research body of research about that. It has affected our culture. Well, then we gotta, we got to have you back <laughs> to talk through. I'd love to talk to you on that level. Yeah, yeah. Because I think that does have some effect in the things that we're seeing today, not only in our money, but in our relationships. Mm -hmm. And we see these instant gratifications of things taking place. And so we sow the seed, and I'll pick on Instagram, put a picture on Instagram. That's the seed. You've sowed it. And then immediately the result is within a few seconds, I've got someone likes it. And so I, I get this validation. What I think is missing, and, and help me, and okay to disagree with me, <laughs> okay. please. But what I think is missing in so many parts of our lives today, in culture, um, in business, in family, is cultivation. That, and I grew up on a farm in North Carolina, and my uncle was a farmer. And we would plant these seeds, whether it be a, a potato half to a tomato plant to mm -hmm. uh, pumpkins and watermelons and all these things I loved doing with, with him. And I was so impatient. You know, I would go back as a young kid and I would look and go, well, wh where's the evidence of the seed that I planted? Mm -hmm. And I think we're in this culture right now is that we're all looking for this evidence of these seeds that we're planting. And we want an instant answer. And it's just not going to happen that way that, you know, going back to the trauma and going back to the things that have, are bad in our life that we have to face sometimes, mm -hmm. picking that scab off. Always, yeah. I always tell people, you know, people come to therapy, they, oh, I'm going to feel so much better. And, if, you know, that initial conversation we always have with mm -hmm. them is that this is going to be pretty painful. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like going through surgery. <laughs> yeah. You feel better at the end, but. We're going to be cutting some things, you know, we'll take it at your pace, but it can be pretty challenging. And I would agree. I think, I know in my own life, I've had to cultivate patience. Mm. And I didn't grow up in this generation, but, and yeah. I grew up where, you know, you had to wait for stuff and it was, you got no's from your parents because they would tell you, I can't afford that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And it's as simple as that. And. You know, and even that, I think because of the culture we're in now in America, I found myself, you know, wanting everything instantly. And yeah. I, over the, and I've had to learn how to sit and be mm. still. I practice that sometimes. Just sit yeah. and be still. I'm not doing anything. The meditation Gen part of yeah, life. Yeah, just to, ho to hopefully help me to maintain a level of patience and being able to wait. Um, I know doing therapy helps, but I believe it's very intentional that you have to 
to have to work on that. But you you know, and everybody complains about the millenniums and the X's and the Z's and the Y's <laughs> and all the different <laughs> alphabets. But you know, I always say, well, you know, our baby boomers we raised them. So what did we do? Right. You know, <laughs> I mean, great point. We raised them, and you know, I, and sometimes I feel that we felt sometimes we had it so difficult. We tried to make it too easy. Yeah. That you know we. We, we tried to just give them everything because now we're in a position to do so. And I th- always, you know, my mom has an old saying. I didn't understand it until recent years, but she said children need the warrant for something. Yeah. And she is, you know, and she always, yeah, and, she, and I didn't quite understand it until I've noticed over the years, just watching some different people raise their kids. And I said, okay, so that's what she meant. She said, you need to let children warrant for something. Yeah. Not because you can't give it to them, but... They should earn the value, you know. So the the value of planting a seed, seed and waiting, wanting the harvest, <laughs> mm-hmm. and or waiting and waiting, you know. So wow, wisdom right there. Yeah, and um, so and I also, you know, I know my own personal philosophy. I heard it many years ago, and it's it's kind of funny. I laugh about it now, but I used to listen to all those personal development guys and stuff. But two people, and I don't remember. Half the stuff they taught, but these two phrases have stuck, and I've kind of guided my life with this. I used to listen to Les Brown, and he had this Les saying. Brown, yeah. He would say, stop telling your sad story at the book at this bus stop because 50% of the people don't care, and 50% of the people glad it's not them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And it sounds that's pretty right. harsh. When I first right. heard, I was like, but I've been thinking, you know, I think, yeah, that's kind of that because stop complaining because – yeah. And the other thing was I heard, I went. I was fortunate enough to see um, Zig Ziglar before he passed away. And he wow. had a saying, and he would say, help enough people to get what they want in life, and you'll get what you want in life. Hmm. And for me, I've kind of used those two things to kind of guide my life, because for me that means help people be kind, support them, and yeah. it, you, won't, you won't suffer for it. Yeah. Okay, so that's kind of been my, and I think if maybe. Some call that the law of reciprocity, like give. And it'd be given. Yeah. But I think if we had, I, you know, and, and I'm just one person here talking in, from my sphere, but I think if we, definitely that last statement, if we had more people that took that approach, yeah. we wouldn't have so much of the division and. Yeah. People saying I got to be right, and I don't want to listen to you. <laughs> well, that's that. that's kind of what I was going back to, Portia, mm-hmm. is that I looked today, and we, you know, it's so easy to complain about what happened to George Floyd, as mm-hmm. an example, and it that was horrible. Mm-hmm. The the guy who committed that atrocity, who committed that crime, should pay. Mm-hmm. But we go, okay, we can all agree on that, but to continually complain about that and how bad it is versus going, all right. Here's an example of what's not right. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do besides complain? Now we have to get from into the streets with that message to into uh, our politicians, into our families, and go, how how do we start building? And you have to start with with me. You know, and I'm... I, I stand on the side of that argument, particularly with the politicians. Unfortunately, there's so much money in politics. Politics. Mm. Now, I think that was one of the worst decisions that happened in our country when you could give millions of dollars. That to buy the vote. To yeah. buy the vote. I, th- I think that so damaged our political. Because before that, you know, they you had two political parties, and you could they could debate and disagree, but they could compromise. Yeah. But I think now, with all of the big money and buying the vote and all. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a, it's tainted. Well, that's where the whole thing and like what Bishop Garlington said is yeah. that everybody wants to be right today yeah. at the cost of reconciliation. Nation. Yeah, and I, you know, and I just don't know how. You, I love America, and I know people look at me as an African American woman and say, "How can you say?" It? But I do. I've been all yeah. over the world, and I've seen a lot of countries. And yeah, it's nice to go visit, but let me get yeah. back home. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay. Um, I just think for all of our problems, there's, there's a lot, lot good, good here. here. Yeah. And so, I just really think that I don't know what it's going to take for us to say. I think this time in, in our nation is. I, I pray we don't miss it. Yeah. Because I feel like we can reshape our nation to be even stronger more echo and really live up to I think we have an amazing constitution I think we have an amazing unique structure for all of our problems and yeah Yeah. it doesn't work maybe for all people but the actual foundation I think is amazing and I just pray 
that we can come together and hopefully our politicians will start worrying about getting reelected yeah. <laughs> and their backers and their donors and really say, okay, we're going to honestly fix this problem. Right. You know, that, that across the board, systemically, we make changes that are sustainable and that, because I really believe, and this that, that's not putting wallpaper, wallpaper over a hole. Yeah. yeah, and then, you know, five years later, we're back here at the same pro. I really yeah. believe that if every segment of American society prospers, then we become a stronger nation. Hmm. You know, and of course, that, that measurement and that prosperity may be different. Okay, yeah. all of us are not going to be millionaires. We'd love to be, but no, all of yeah. us are not. But I believe if everybody in our nation has a quality of life and has opportunity and can go to school, I, I just believe we're better. As, we'll be a stronger nation. There was a philosopher <laughs> in the 1700s, and I, I've, I've got to find this quote. Mm-hmm. Um, so you guys find it and fact check me. But he said, during that time of, of world uh, wealth, mm-hmm. he said if you took all the world's wealth and you divided it amongst everyone equally, Mm -hmm. that within six months it would be back in the control of 1% of the world's population. Mm -hmm. And and I think there's a lot of truth in that. I don't know if there's really scientific Mm -hmm. data to support that, Mm -hmm. but what I would say is that people want leadership, and that's really what it comes back to. Mm -hmm. Um, People want to be led, not told. And... You know, we, if we can have the freedom to make choice, and I, I, I think I would agree with you in this, is that in the U.S., unlike any other country in the world, we can get out and say some pretty radical things and have zero Constant. consequence mm-hmm. other than our community and maybe mm-hmm. someone on Twitter mm-hmm. or Facebook, you know, uh, uh, giving us, uh, shutting us down to um, calling us out, mm-hmm. but... I can't think of any other place in the world, maybe Canada, maybe England uh, or Great Britain, where you can pretty much say anything you want to and there be little to no consequence for your your statements or actions. But even the UK doesn't have the level of freedom of speech that we have. Yeah, <laughs> Which true. I've found that out quite by mistake. I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> when I was talking to some, some people I, I met from there, but... Yeah, and that is our greatest asset, and sometimes it's our greatest liability, liability here yeah. in this nation. Because it's, I think we're struggling with where's the line. Right. You know, you don't, you can't yell fire in a theater; you get arrested for that. They know that's, <laughs> but um, but it's kind of. But where does where do we draw the line there? And, and I six don't months ago, you couldn't wear a mask into a store in Virginia Beach w- without it being a misdemeanor. Yes, but now you can. Now you can. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> And sorry, I, Virginia Beach. Yeah, and I sorry, think, not sorry. Yeah, but I think that's why we call this the Great American Experiment because we're yeah. trying to figure out those things. Right. Um, but I still think the basis of our <laughs> government and our laws and our constitution. And I really saw that when I traveled overseas in some of the European countries, and I was doing some of the work. Um, not doing the work, but just learning about migration and, and yeah. rights of immigrants, and just how our constitution is offers a lot of rights and protections to many um, people, but it's just how do we bring this actually, how do we actually make a practical application for right. today's society? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I appreciate you saying that, and it's encouraging to, to, to hear you um, put it that way because we, we live in a world, again, of instantaneous information, mm. and, and while we're practicing, it's playing out in front of everyone, um, And, you know, this great experiment that we're in called um, a republic that Mm -hmm. is a democracy. Democracy. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things I can say is is we if we if we look for bad, we'll find it. But if we just take a few minutes and do a a self-reflection on our entire nation, Mm -hmm. um, there is no other place in this planet and the known universe Mm -hmm. that I'd rather be. Oh, yeah. Is right here in the grand old USA. So yeah, we have our issues, but there's a lot of good. Yeah, and man, uh, we can look at the good. I can sit across from a, a a beautiful black lady today, have a great conversation with you, and not have any fear of uh, retribution for that. And and can have that that hasn't always been true. And that's that's, that's my true. point. Yeah. 
um, that we have had progress. We have seen cultivation. We have seen a great harvest. Doesn't mean we quit quit seeding, we quit planting, we quit cultivating, mm-hmm. which is the, the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that if, if we continue to cultivate the things that are good and the things that can be good, we'll get a good harvest. Oh, yeah. And, you know, like I said, I believe this is, some people said this is a reckoning for the United States. I just think everything has a season, and I believe mm-hmm. this is just our season to deal with some of the stuff, that, the elephants in the room. Yeah. <laughs> we have a great responsibility, don't we, to yeah. to continue what was hard. And like what you said in your, your fire book, um, that you... Uh, and and we'll end on this today, but and and hopefully I don't make it emotional, too emotional for you. But you you went back to an event um, that the city had invited mm-hmm. you to, mm-hmm. and you said you got pretty choked up seeing uh, female African American females and females in general that were um, at this event. And you looked around the room at how many were in there. Mm-hmm. Am I am I yeah. getting that right? Can yeah, you they, take take us back to that? Yeah, they they were doing a an event to honor the African American pioneers in my department. And when I walked into the auditorium, I saw all of these African American men and, and I saw women, officers. Hmm. I mean, it was just so many. And in my day and time, that was no, that was not even a thought. And so I got not sh- just a general firefighter. Uh, yeah. Officers. Officers. These are all officers, chief, wow. race, captains. And I got choked up about it because, and some of them I had trained wow. before I left the department. And I just, I felt like all that I had endured, which, you know, the book Cultivation. Only <laughs> Cultivation. <Endure. laughs> okay. Cultivation. Cultivation. Yeah. Cultivation. Um, and the book doesn't even cover all the stuff that we, that many of us dealt with. But yeah, that's but second I, edition. You're right. Second yeah. edition. But I just really felt that it had, had been worth it because I often wonder sometimes. And mm. I had had conversations with one of my. He's still like a brother to me. And I, we used to ask, you know, is this really worth it? All the fighting, all the act, you know, us trying yeah. to advocate to make things fair. You know, is anybody? Is this going to really matter once I walk out this door? And. Um, it mattered, and it was interesting because even now, some of those people, I mean, I say, oh, call me Portia. No, they, they still call me Captain. And it's like, call me Portia. No, Captain. Captain yeah. <laughs> you know, so I know it's out of respect, but it was amazing. Um, I just really felt like um, I had gotten some reward for all of that. All of course you did. Well, thank you. Thank you for being one of those pioneers. All right. And thank you for being on the show today and sharing your story, and please – Go take a look at, at Portia's books. I think there's some great healing that we can all have and having understanding and having uh, broaden our horizons and and broaden our territories of what we know to be true and really examining, you know, uh, other stories. So thank you for sharing yours today. I'm sorry, you know, an hour is a long time for a video podcast, but I, I can't quite do it to the Joe Rogan level at three hours yet, so I got to go pee. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for having me. I've yeah, we're, we're, I would love to get you back okay. uh, in the future, and we'll talk more about roles and roles and associates and your okay. your business and what you're doing in the community to help and uh, that that whole money aspect. But okay. thank you for sharing it. I think it was much needed conversation today to to help continue with. Uh, the pro- progress of being able to have community and, and share our our likeness and our differences. And uh, mm-hmm. it was fun doing this with you today. Thank so you. Che- cheers to you. Cheers to you. God bless you. Okay. you too. Thanks. Thank you. Have a great day. All right. Thank you.